Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis by uh, sending a donation via the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net, or by PayPal to support.greatdetectives.net, or also by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. For those of you who've just started listening recently, typically we have a different detective program uh, continuing ongoing Monday through Saturday. However, we had a listener's choice vote in March, and listeners voted for their top 20 choices in the standard division and their top five choices in the short division. And we are counting them down as we head to the 10th anniversary of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio coming up on October the 26th. And today we are in our short division of series that had 10 or less episodes out there uh, in circulation. And uh, number three on that list is The Fat Man. The original air date on today's episode is January the 2nd of 1948. And this one is Murder Plays Hide and Seek. When your stomach's upset... Don't add to the upset. Take soothing Pepto-Bismol and feel good again. There he goes into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scale. Weight, 237 pounds. Fortune, danger. Who is it? The Fat Man. The Norwich Pharmacal Company, makers of Pepto-Bismol, Unguentine, and other fine drug products, brings you the adventures of Dashiell Hammett's fascinating and exciting character, The Fat Man, a fast-moving criminologist who tips the scales at 237 pounds. Tonight's adventure, starring J. Scott Smart in Murder Plays Hide and Seek. And now, from New York, Pepto-Bismol brings you The Fat Man. The housing shortage may be bad, but there's one place I know of that always has room for another tenant. It's a big gray structure near the river, and the windows are crossed with iron bars, and the landlord never asks you for a penny in rent. If you're an extra special customer, they even give you a private suite in a secluded part of the building that leads directly to a room with a heavy chair. That room is reserved for the guys who find out that they can't get away with murder. The fat man learned his business the hard way. But there's an easy way to care for an upset stomach. Just don't overdose with antacids or physics. Instead, take Pepto-Bismol, the gentle way to help settle and sweeten the stomach quickly. Pepto-Bismol calms and quiets the disturbance by spreading a soothing, protective coating on irritated stomach and intestinal walls. You begin to lose that queasy, uneasy feeling right away. The next time careless eating or overindulgence gives you acid stomach, nervous indigestion, or heartburn, you'll get quick relief if you remember this. When your stomach's upset, don't add to the upset. Take soothing Pepto-Bismol. And feel good again.
Now, the fat man in Murder Plays Hide and Seek. Inasmuch as eating is one habit I find very hard to break, I usually prefer my clients to have enough cash to pay for my work. In Andy Moroni's case, however, I made an exception to the rule. I've known Andy for quite a while, and I can guess what he earns driving that hack of his around from dusk to dawn. With a wife and three kids, you can't afford any fancy fees for a private detective. It was almost three in the morning when Andy knocked on my apartment door. All right. All right. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. Uh, who is it? It's Andy Maroney, Mr. Runyon. The hacky. Well, what's on your mind, Andy? I, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. You gotta help me, see? Now take it easy, Andy. I thought he was drunk when she asked me to take him home. I had nothing to do with it, Mr. Runyon, so help me. Now, will you calm down long enough to make some sense? I, I'm talking about the stiff. The guy who was croaked. What guy? Where is he? Downstairs, in the back of my cab. For the love of Mike, will you hurry? Well, do you mind if I put some clothes on? I'll lose my license. I'll lose my job and they'll put me in the cooler for 160 years. Here, hand me those shoes. You're a right guy, Mr. Runyon. Every hacky knows you're okay. You help me out of this, and I'll pay you back if it takes the rest of my life. Well, it's too long to wait. Put this one on the house. There we are. I... Now I'll get my coat, and we'll be off. Okay, come on. I got the hack parked in the front of the door. As soon as I saw the guy was dead, I, I made a beeline for your flat. I figured I could explain it better to you than I could to the cops. You ever seen him before? No. He was sitting in the back of my cab when I came out of the beanery. I, I only left the car parked for about 20 minutes while I got some sinkers and some java. A blonde dame standing by the cab handed me five bucks to take him home, so I figured he was drunk. Here, out this way. There's a hack. He's flopped over in the rear seat. What is this, Andy? A corny gag? Holy smoke. The stiff is gone. He must have been dreaming. Uh, he was there, I tell you, on the level. He was sitting there in the back five minutes ago. How do you know he was dead? Because I shook him. I felt his pulse. There was blood coming out of his mouth. Hey, wait a minute. What's this on the floor? It's his hat. That's the hat the guy was wearing. Hey, his initials are on the sweatband, C.H. Where were you taking him, Andy? Did this blonde give you his address? Yeah. It turned out to be a phony. That's when I found out he was dead. I thought he'd passed out, and I, I tried to shake him into giving me his right house number. Would you recognize the woman if you saw her again? In a minute. She was a tall job, easy on the eyes. She was standing on the sidewalk next to my hack, uh, wearing an evening gown. You mean without a coat in this weather? Well, come to think of it, she didn't have a coat. Come on, get into this jalopy, and let's get started. Where are we going? Back to the corner where you met your customer. <laughs> This is it, Mr. Runyon. Yeah. What's that joint over there? Nightclub? Yeah, the Venetian blind. It's a fancy dump that gets the ermine crowd. Well, if that blonde wasn't wearing a coat, she must have come out of there. Well, it's almost four o'clock. The joint must be closed. Well, we'll try it anyway. Yeah, it's closed up like I said. See anything through the glass in the door? There's a light on in the hall. Oh, wait a minute. A dame's coming out. Uh, no, it ain't the same one. Oh, good evening. I'm sorry. The club is closed for the night. You work in here, miss? Yes, I do. This isn't a pickup. I'm just looking for information. Did you happen to see a good-looking, tall, blonde woman? She was wearing a silver evening dress an hour ago. That sounds like Mrs. Rogers, the owner. Is she inside? Yes, I think so. What are you, a policeman? What gives you that impression? You act like one. My name is Runyon. I'm a private detective. I've got a little business with your boss. He's in her office, I imagine. 
Come inside and I'll show you where it is. Thanks. Is everybody else going home for the night? I guess so. I'm Peggy Dale. I sing with the orchestra. Hey, Peggy! Oh, I thought you'd gone, Frank. I was waiting for you, baby. I hope maybe I could take you home. Uh, who's this? He's a private detective. His name is Runyon. What's the matter? Something wrong? That all depends. Who are you? Frank Cooley. I handle the drums in the band. What's up? We're looking for a stolen corpse. You what? Do you, you two happen to know anyone with the initial C.H.? Uh, not me. I know a woman named Hunt. Clarissa Hunt. This particular C.H. is a man. There she is, Mr. Runyon. It's Mrs. Rogers. What's going on here? Are you sure she's the woman who handed you the fiver, Andy? Positive, Mr. Runyon. You remember me, lady? No. I sure you remember. You asked me to take that drunk home, and you gave me a five spot to do it. I never saw you before in my life. It's a frame. She's lying, I tell you. Relax, Andy. Mrs. Rogers, you wouldn't be holding out on us by any chance, huh? I don't know what you're talking about. That drunk that Andy chauffeured for was dead. You wouldn't like to be mixed up in a murder rap, would you? No. Then how about a few details? I don't know anything about a drunk or a dead man. I never saw this moron before. Listen, you double-crossing hen. I ain't taking it to the neck for nobody. Pipe down, Andy. Mr. Runyon. What's the matter? Look, under that drape, near the window. There's a guy's feet sticking out. Stay where you are now, all three of you. What? It, it's Charlie Haney. And he's dead. Well, it looks like we've found our body, Andy. Uh Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Runyon. That ain't the same guy who was in my cab. Two hours later, I was in Lieutenant McKenzie's office at headquarters. The dawn was just about breaking, and I listened to Mac's autopsy report as I sipped a welcome container of steaming coffee. Charlie Haney was poisoned, Brad. Stuff was slipped into a drink. What about the blood on his mouth? Poison they used was dynamite. Brought on a hemorrhage. The guy in Andy's cab got his walking papers in the exact same way. I don't know. I'm inclined to think that Charlie Haney and the guy in Maroney's hack were one and the same. Why? Because the initials in the hat? That's one reason. And Maroney admitted the back of his cab was dark when he looked at his passenger. He's scared, Mac. He'll admit almost anything if he thought he'd save you a little trouble. Now, personally, I think we're dealing with two different killings, and both the victims have the same initials. Then what happened to corpse number one? Well, it's a since she didn't walk to a funeral partner to, to get himself registered. Well, I question the girl, the musician, and Mrs. Rogers. You any dope? Uh, not much. Charlie Haney was a jack-of-all-trades around the Venetian blind. Did odd jobs for Mrs. Rogers. Sometimes he'd throw out an obstreperous customer... A bouncer, huh? He was big enough. Yeah, I'd say he was. Well, in any case, I had nothing on him, so I let him loose. I might have held Mrs. Rogers on suspicion, but her battery of lawyers would have sprung her anyway. What about Andy Maroney? Well, he's in the clear so far. I'm letting him go back to his cab, but I'm padlocking the Venetian blind while the investigation goes on. If you don't mind my saying so, Mac, that isn't a very smart move. No? Why? I think you'd be better off to keep the club open and give the killer a chance to show up again. Uh, look, Brad, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Okay, yeah, sure. Lay off this case. Why? Well, first of all, your client's in the clear, so that's taken care of. And secondly? I won't buy your theory about two victims. And it's the kind of a thing that might confuse the investigation. Sensitive, Mac? Now, you know better than that. <laughs> I'm just saying that your guesswork is cockeyed. And I'm going to have enough trouble solving the murder of one victim without searching for an imaginary corpse. Hello? Yes, Mackenzie speaking. What? Oh. Yeah, I'll be right over. Here, Brad. Have a cigar. You look as if you're giving away a prize. I am. One of the motorcycle squad just picked up a dead man under the Queensborough Bridge. The initials on his wallet were C.H.
I rode over to the Queensborough Bridge with Mackenzie and saw the body. It was identified by Andy as the guy he'd had in his cab. And a card in his wallet gave his name as Casper Hall. They took him back to the morgue for an autopsy, but I was pretty sure of what they'd find. So I drove back to my apartment to catch up with a few hours of sleep. It must have been 11 or 11.30 in the morning when I found myself with another guest. And this one was just as unexpected as the last. Yeah, just a second. One of these days, I'm liable to get myself some sleep. Good morning, Mr. Runyon. Well, good morning. Come in. Thanks. I... Sorry, the room's in such a mess. I wasn't expecting company. That's all right. You're the gal I saw last night, the gal that sings the Venetian blind. That's right, Peggy Dale. Uh, cigarette, Peggy? No, thank you. Where are you going? I want to look out the window. I had a feeling I was being followed. Anybody there? Street's empty. What's on your mind, sweetheart? Before I tell you anything... I want to be sure you won't tell anybody I told you. Oh, is it that hot? It might be. Okay, I'll play ball. Let's have it. They're holding Mrs. Rogers at headquarters now. Are they? Again? When they found the man named Casper Hall, they took that taxi driver's word against hers about putting him into the cab. Oh, yeah? I was there when they questioned Mrs. Rogers. They questioned me as well. She finally admitted putting Hall into the cab. And her excuse was that she thought he was a drunk and she wanted to get rid of him so he wouldn't raise a fuss. Well, that sounds logical to me. But one thing she didn't tell him. What's that? That she'd seen and talked to Casper Hall before. You knew that? He's been in the Venetian blind a dozen times. And I've seen him at the same table with Mrs. Rogers. Did you tell that to the lieutenant? No. Why not? Because Mrs. Rogers would have heard me. I'm scared of her, Mr. Runyon. She's hard and she's mean. It's not only my job. I don't want to end up... The way poor Charlie did. Well, I can't blame you for that. She's been mixed up with gangsters and racketeers ever since she went into the nightclub business. I've seen some of them at the blind. So you decided to spill the beans to me, hmm? You can tell the lieutenant, but I don't want any part of it. Okay, Peggy. Thanks for calling. Oh, by the way, uh, is Mackenzie padlocking the club? No. He was going to, but he changed his mind. Will you be there tonight? I guess so. Why? I just wanted to ask you to save me a ringside table. The Venetian blind seems to have the most interesting floor show in town. I checked with the Kenzie and gave him the dope, but he couldn't hang on to Mrs. Rogers. He didn't have enough evidence to get an indictment yet. That meant Mrs. Rogers would be back in her club that night, and so would I. I got in touch with Andy Maroney, who showed up at my flat about ten, just as I was putting the finishing touches to the soup and fish. Sit down, Andy. Be with you in a minute. Say, you look pretty slick in that outfit, Mr. Runyon. Well, you said the Venetian blind catered to the airman crowd, so I decided to get the dinner jacket out of mothballs. You know, I was just thinking. Yeah, what? My uncle. Yeah? What about your uncle? He was buried in an outfit like that. Stop being so cheerful. I intend to wear it vertically. Uh, you want me to drive you over? Yeah, that's why I called. There's something else I want you to do. Anything you say. When I go into that club, I want you to park outside and keep your eyes open. If I'm not out of there within two hours, get a hold of the police. I'm uh, expecting trouble? I'm not expecting it, Andy. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> It had started to snow when we got down to the street, and the night was crisp and cold. If I hadn't been so busy admiring the weather, I might have noticed that Andy's hack, which was standing in front of the door, was occupied once again. Hello, Mr. Runyon. Oh, what are you doing here, Cooley? I want to talk to you. Okay, move over. Drive straight to the Venetian blind, Andy. Right. Don't drive to the blind. Let's go in the other direction. Say, who's giving the orders around here? I am. Hey, he's got a gun. Drive in the other direction, Andy, as the gentleman requests. I'd put that gun away, Frankie. 
Drums are safer to fool with. I'll put it away when I'm good and ready. Suits yourself. And I'll be ready when I put a slug in you. Been drinking? That's none of your business. It's funny how a pint of booze makes a lion out of, of a mouse. I'll show you who's a mouse when we get out of town, fat man. Mr. Runyon. Keep driving, Andy. Yeah, yeah, keep on driving. Unless you want the top of your head opened up for ventilation. Before you start popping that cannon, I hope you'll explain why you picked me for a target. You know why. Oh, do I? You should have had sense enough to keep out of this. You wise and hymed yourself right onto a slab. Who are you covering for, Frankie? Yourself? Never mind the questions. Because up to now, it was Mrs. Rogers who held my interest. J- Mrs. Rogers? Yeah. If you're covering for her, you're just wasting your time. By tomorrow morning, we'll have enough on your boss to get an indictment. You're, uh, you're uh, pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Well, I was, until you shoved that rod in my rib. Now I'm beginning to change my mind. Yeah, so am I. Really? Stop this cab, mister. There are lots of people in this section, Cooley. You're not going to risk any fireworks in a spot like this, are you? Keep driving and don't look back. Go on, beat it! For, for a minute, I thought he was going to knock the two of us off. And so did I. But instead, he gave me a brand new angle. There's a cop on the corner. Do you want to make a report? Ah, forget it. I may have a much more interesting report to make to the cops later on. <laughs> It was almost 11 when we got to the Venetian blind. The place was pretty well crowded. The customers were dressed to kill, and most of the gals were flashing diamonds. Marsha Rogers' sucker list would have matched the social register. Instead of taking a table, I sat at the bar where the view was better. The floor show wasn't the only thing I wanted to see. Give me a rum and Coca-Cola. You can put it on the house, Pete. Thanks. But I like to buy my own. I had a feeling you'd be back here tonight, fat man. I would have been disappointed if you didn't show. You do a good business, don't you, Mrs. Rogers? Not bad. Found any corpses tonight? Now, don't start trying to be funny. You're liable to find you've outstayed your welcome. Still in your silver gown, huh? I thought you'd be wearing black. For whom? Casper Hall. Casper didn't mean anything to me. That's something you might have to prove. I was informed he spent a lot of time here. So do my other customers. Yeah, but they don't usually get picked up cold under the Queensboro Bridge. The cops haven't got anything on me. They don't even have enough to close up my club. That's where you're mistaken, Marcia. Then why didn't they shut me up? Because I asked them not to. You? Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not getting philanthropic. Then what's the big idea? Well, maybe I like your entertainment. Oh, by the way, where's your regular drummer? Cooley? Yeah. He quit. Why? Don't ask me. When a musician wants to leave, I don't call the FBI and check up on him. I have a little surprise for you, sweetheart. Have you? I think I got this double murder partially solved. You're a very smart boy. When Casper Hall was poisoned, the killer didn't expect him to leave the club so soon. After he was helped out, Charlie Haney, or bouncer, was sent after his body... What did he want the body for, a souvenir? There must have been something Hall was carrying that the killer wanted. Charlie couldn't frisk him fast enough while he lay in the cab. So he snatched the body and ditched it under the bridge. Then who killed Charlie Haney? The one who killed Casper Hall. Charlie knew too much. He was just dumb enough to stick his neck out. Then why don't you make an arrest? Because I haven't put my hand on the murderer yet. How would you like to set yourself up for the candidate? You're crazy. You knew he was dying when you helped him into that cab. And don't hand me that drunk story. It doesn't gel. I thought you said Casper got out of here too fast. Would I have pushed him into a cab and then sent Charlie after him? No. That's why I'm crossing you off my list. But I still think you're holding out. And in case you don't know it, baby... An accomplice sits right on top of the killer's lap when they give him the chair. Why should I hold out? That's not the $64 question, sweetheart. The point is, why didn't you yell for the cops in the first place when you found Casper Hall five minutes from the grave? You want me to tell you why? Yes. Casper must have given you something when you put him in that cab. 
He gave you what the killer wanted and what Charlie Haney was sent out to get. Well, baby, how am I doing? You're doing fine. Come with me. She took me to her office without another word. And I had the feeling my bluff was paying off in spades. The theory was a good one, and it accounted for everything that happened. But I couldn't prove it in a hundred years if she'd wanted to call me on it. The office was dark when I opened the door, but I caught the sound of someone bumping into a chair as I stepped inside. Stand still, Mrs. Rogers. There's someone in this room, and I'm telling that someone now that I'll shoot to kill if I see anything move when the lights go on. Snap the switch, Mrs. Rogers. Peggy! I was just... She's trying to get at my safe. That's not true. What do you got in your safe that's so important, Mrs. Rogers? I'll show you in just a minute. <laughs> now stand, stand right there, Peggy, like a nice little girl. Here. Here, this, this is what Casper Hall gave me the night he died. There's slips of paper in this envelope, written in longhand. In the last few months, six of my customers were robbed after they left my place. Their names are on those slips. They were all held up after on their way home, and the police never found the gunman. There's more than just a name on each piece of paper. There's a description of a car, the license number, an address, and a list of jewelry. Casper Hall was tipped off whenever an important customer made a reservation. Those women used to come here loaded with jewelry. Someone must have gotten the information beforehand and then handed it to Casper outside on those strips of paper. Then all he had to do was follow the right car. Would you know who that someone is, Peggy? No. Oh, now, don't be coy, sweetheart. I had you tagged when your drummer boy, Frankie Cooley, wanted to take me for a ride. He was crazy enough about you to commit murder and keep you in the clear, Peggy. But he changed his mind when I told him I was after Mrs. Rogers. Give me that envelope! Oh, no, not so fast, baby. I'll need this myself for a while. We're going to do a little handwriting analysis. He crossed me. The rat held out, and he used those slips like a club over my head. That kind of an argument ought to make a big hit with a jury. Mrs. Rogers, why didn't you hand those slips over to the police? I only held those slips for one reason. If the thing leaked out before you grabbed the killer, I'd have been ruined. No one would have come here anymore. They'd all been scared to death. Didn't Casper tell you who gave him the slips? Casper couldn't talk when I helped him out and put him in that cab. All he could do was push that envelope in my hand. I was frightened, and, and I only wanted to get rid of him in a hurry. Uh-huh. Well, i got to hand it to you, Peggy. You certainly must have what it takes. Drop dead, fat man. <laughs> Knowing you were going to kill Charlie Haney because he knew too much, you charmed him into frisking a corpse. Then you sicked Frank Cooley on me with a rod in his hand. But you're going to run into one guy who won't fall for the pretty dimples, sweetheart. The public executioner at Sing Sing. The fat man returns in a moment. It's a shame to let an upset stomach interfere with your work or your fun. And it needn't if you keep a bottle of Pepto-Bismol in your medicine chest. Pepto-Bismol helps you and your children to quick relief from sour stomach acid indigestion, heartburn, and other common digestive upsets. This famous pink liquid helps settle and sweeten the stomach, calms and quiets that queasy, uneasy, sickish feeling. Get a bottle of Pepto-Bismol from your druggist tonight. Pepto-Bismol is a dependable product of the Norwich Pharmacal Company, also makers of Unguentine, the first thought in Burns. Next week, Pepto-Bismol presents Dashiell Hammett's exciting character, The Fat Man, in the adventure called Murder Finds a Decoy. And now, a word from the fat man. Ever since the beginning of time, the female of the species has been beguiling the male with her charms. And the male, since the beginning of time, has been falling into the trap quite willingly. But both male and female our most unwilling victims when murder finds a decoy. (laughs) 
Tonight's Adventure of the Fat Man, starring J. Scott Smart, was written by Lawrence Clee and directed by Clark Andrews. Music is under the direction of Bernard Green. Heard tonight were Helen Flint as Marcia and Joe Harding as Andy. Remember, when your stomach's upset, don't add to the upset. Take soothing Pepto-Bismol and feel good again. Charles Irving speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. I could have sworn that there was an episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe uh, that uh, had a similar plot, and uh, I couldn't find it. So maybe I misremembered. There was an episode uh, that was similar to this uh, on Nick Carter, but I don't think Lawrence Clee wrote that. It's interesting uh, having Lawrence Clee write for The Fat Man because the thing he was most uh, well-known for writing was Mr. King's Racer of Lost Persons. And this is very, very different from that. And it pro goes to illustrate that whatever issues people had with Mr. Keene had to do more with what the Hummerts wanted the show to be rather than the talent of Mr. Clay as a writer. The Fat Man was extremely popular for its time. The people who were alive, who listened to it, uh, have very fond and distinct memories of it. It's just unfortunate that there are so many episodes missing. You have just ten episodes spread out over the five seasons of the series. And it was just so much uh, more important in the life of America than just those 10 episodes out there would indicate. Now we turn uh, to listener comments and feedback and have this from Linda, who writes, I'm having a hard time after listening to Mandel Kramer. He's so good. I'm in love with his voice and his smooth delivery. Well, thanks so much uh, for the comment, Linda. And I'd say Mandel Kramer definitely was very good as an actor and great for radio. Uh, even though most of his career he got saddled with playing, you know, secondary heavies and things of that sort. Uh, Johnny Dollar really gives him a good chance to shine as the lead. Of course, if you'd like to hear all of Mandel Kramer's Johnny Dollar run, it is still in the uh, main uh, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar feed. Oh, thanks so much. And I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon of the day. And I want to thank Bruce. Bruce has been one of our Patreon supporters since April, and he's currently supporting us at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Bruce. And uh, we will be back tomorrow with Let George Do It. And then next Monday, we will continue on with number 11 on our Listener's Choice Countdown uh, for the Standard Division. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.